So as part of the Dark Eye interview series, I'm here with Penty Haddington. Um, he's Professor of English Language and Social Interaction um, in the Faculty of Humanities at the University of Hulu. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time during a very short and busy trip to do this interview. Thank you. It's, um, it's a pleasure. It's, it's, it was really nice to, for you to invite me. Thank you very much for accepting. And I'm just going to start off with the first question, mm -hmm. which is how you got interested in conversation analysis. Well, that was, I think it was around the year 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't, it was uh, my then future PhD supervisor knocked on my door and said, Would you like to uh, do, your, do a PhD in my project? And I thought, Yeah, sure, I mean, it sounds interesting, I'll do that. And, uh, and, and she, she was interested in stance and, and, and she had been to California and, and been influenced by conversation analysis. Mm -hmm. And she said that, that one methodology in the project would be to use conversation analysis. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I accepted, got funding, and, uh, and that was it. So I, I knew nothing about conversation analysis wow. at the time, so I really had to start from scratch. Uh, that was a long, sometimes painful process, because it's not an easy method to, to grasp. Uh, but then in, uh, in 2001, so when my PhD project started, I, I got funding to go to Santa Barbara wow. for a year. And uh, there I, I, I was fortunate enough to be able to work with Sandra Thompson, mm. uh, Jean Lerner. Mm. And uh, so they, that's when I really, really started to get into conversation analysis and understand it, so what you can do with it. Mm. And also, uh, uh, coincidentally, in, in Santa Barbara, in, in the summer of 2001, uh, the Linguistic Society of America organized a summer school. Mm -hmm. And they had uh, at least two courses in conversation analysis. So one was by Emmanuel Shercloff, so he thought the basics of uh, conversation analysis. And then the other one was on institutional interaction by John Heritage, and I now forget who the other teacher was, but that was sort of, so it was right from the beginning of my PhD project that I got, so got to see these people and hear from them what CA was. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got interested in what you can do with conversation analysis. That's amazing. Uh, so you mentioned your PhD project. Mm -hmm. uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yes, that, uh, so that was, it was basically my supervisor, Elisa Gerdgen's project, and, and she was applying funding for that. And uh, as I said, she was interested in stance and stance taking. Mm -hmm. And she just said, that, okay, can you write a proposal mm -hmm. that somehow answers or asks a question about stance taking somehow? And I said, yeah, I can, I can think of something. And I was, I was interested in news interview interaction, mm -hmm. uh, news interviews, discourse. And I thought that, okay, I'll, that'll be something that would be interesting to study. And uh, that's what I did. Uh, so I started to, I, I collected some data in, in while I was in the States and then also mm -hmm. afterwards in Britain. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what I studied for my PhD. And basically it was, I think, it, to, to sum it up somehow, the idea was to, to look, I was really, got really interested in how the interviewers, in news interviews, how they set up positions for uh -huh. the interviewees. So, uh, so that's what I looked at, and uh, and also sort of the, the interviewee strategies to mm -hmm. to sort of uh, not answer the questions or mm -hmm. get around the mm -hmm. positions that that they've been uh, set up to answer. So, so that was it. And I think because with Elisa Gargan's background, she comes from this the discourse functional linguistics mm -hmm. background. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we read a lot about stance mm -hmm. and, and how stance has been studied in linguistics. So basically the, the dissertation was a linguistic study. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in linguistics, stance has been uh, often conceptualized as a sort of an individual thing, yes. something that's evident in words or discourse markers or phrases mm -hmm. or something like mm -hmm. that. And then uh, so with the CA method, it was interesting to look at how stances are kind of a collaborative, yeah. sort of emergent phenomenon 
that sort of are created uh, and negotiated in interaction. So that was in sort of basically what my dissertation was about. Fascinating. So you mentioned linguistics, and your background is in linguistics. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that influenced the way you approach conversation analysis um, and how you did it? Um, yeah, I think so. I, I, I think it's evident in, in the way I look at social action. So I, I really focus on talk mm -hmm. and, and, and the linguistic elements of talk and grammar. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in particular, so especially in transcribing. So I mean, the people transcribe in very different ways and I think in the, in the way I like to do transcription is to really focus on the details. Mm -hmm. So prosodic details, intonation, and so on. So I think that that comes from my linguistics background, sort of the the focus on the details. Yeah. Um, so CA um, is very popular now in Finland mm -hmm. uh, and has been quite uh, for a while now. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how, how CA came to Finland and how it uh, spread? I'm I'm not absolutely sure what happened, uh, <laughs> right. but I've heard stories. All right. And uh, so one story goes that uh, uh, Professor Emeri Tauli Hakulinen, mm -hmm. who, who's a professor of Finnish at the University of Helsinki, that she visited uh, California, I, I, I think UCLA, mm -hmm. sometimes in the 80s, and got really interested in and fascinated by the conversation mm -hmm. analytic method. Mm -hmm. And she came back to Finland and talked to people about what CA is, what you can do with it. And I think then, I mean, she had her students, and of course then her students spread the this uh, appreciation of CA as a method. And uh, so that's sort of one way it started to spread in Finland. Mm -hmm. So that's what very, of, very often is said, that Auli Hakulin in you want to identify one person who's mm -hmm. responsible for CA mm -hmm. in Finland, it's Auli Hakkul. Mm -hmm. uh, but then in, in the 90s as well, so there were many, many linguists who went to California, to UCLA or Santa Barbara, so sort of without knowing each other before they went there. Mm -hmm. So they were there at the same time and got influenced by CA. Um, so going back to your history and your sort of academic trajectory. Mm -hmm. uh, you've worked in a couple of institutions so far. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, the different positions that you've occupied? And yep. like uh, so I started as a PhD student in 2001. And before that, I think it was in 1998, I started to work in a European Union project. Mm -hmm. It was a linguistics project. Uh, and this course analytic project mm -hmm. on the readability of baby food labeling. And uh, so this, that was very interesting. So I, I, I knew nothing about this course analysis, nothing about linguistics when I entered the project, but I learned a lot. It was a, a fascinating project. So that's where my sort of researcher's career started 20 years ago, in fact. Amazing. And, uh, and then I did my PhD project, and I was I I was working in Elisa Garkanen's project, as I said. And I also got funding from uh, it was a Finnish a national graduate school for language mm -hmm. students called Langnet mm -hmm. or something like that. So I, I got funding for four years in that graduate school, and uh, so that that was very good. I was very fortunate. And then in 2005, uh, I, I got my PhD. And then just before I got my PhD, I started as a lecturer at the University of Oldham. So I, I, I taught general linguistics mm -hmm. for two years. And uh, that was a very, so, a very, very interesting uh, period of my career because I, I knew on the basis of what I had studied in Santa Barbara and what I had studied before. So I, I had this mm -hmm. sort of a general idea of general, mm -hmm. of not general idea, but I knew things about general linguistics. And, mm -hmm. uh, but I also decided to study more 
So I study general linguistics at the same time at the University of Joensu in Finland as I was teaching it in, in, in Oulu. And uh, so that, that, was, that was nice. Uh, I had that position for two years. So I learned a lot about language and grammar uh, at that time. And then, uh, so at the, that work contract was coming to an end, and as it often happens, I mean, you, you become anxious about what's, what will happen next. Mm. Will I get a job? Will I be able to continue mm. in the academia? Mm. And then I, I was lucky enough to get a postdoc position that was funded by the University of Oulu mm. uh, for three years. And uh, so I, I started in that. And after two years, I, so I continued to apply for other positions, mm -hmm. other research funding. And, and then I got a position, a researcher's position, at the University of Helsinki, mm -hmm. the Helsinki Collegium for mm -hmm. Advanced Studies. And that, that was extremely important, sort of a, a, a new... I think that's an important thing for any researcher to do, to go somewhere else and see something new, experience something new. And uh, so I spent three years there and uh, in addition to having contacts with linguists and, and conversation analysts, I was, because most of the, the researchers in, in the collegium came from other disciplines, so there were mm -hmm. philosophers, historians, sociologists and so on. So I was really able to broaden my understanding of what mm -hmm. humanities and social sciences is. So that lasted for three years. Uh, then again, towards the end of that period, I was like getting a bit worried about what, what will happen next. I, I, I had a position at the University of Oul, which was a permanent position. It was a teaching position, mm -hmm. so I wasn't too eager mm -hmm. to return to that because I thought that really want to continue doing research and that's why I, I continue to apply for different jobs in, in, in different universities in Finland but then I then I got a position in in, in English philology where I'm currently working mm -hmm. as a university lecturer and uh, so that was in 2009 mm -hmm. and, uh, and I worked taught a lot so there was a after several years of research, it was a sort of complete uh, transfer to a teaching position and mm -hmm. with quite a lot of administration, so that was a, a big change. Yeah. Uh, but that was nice, it was nice to teach, and it still is nice to te teach. And, and then in 2000, and no, that was 2012, sorry, when I returned mm -hmm. to all. Where is <laughs> and and then two years after that, so uh, uh, there was an opening. The professor professorship was opened in Oulu and applied, and I got that. So that's where I am well, at the moment. Right. So it's a long, sort of long career. And and when you, I notice, I realize that when you describe it like this, mm. it sounds smooth. <laughs> One thing has led to the other, and it hasn't been like that. So it's it's mm. it's been very complicated, and mm. there are worries, and uh, you worry about the future, what will happen, and so on. But it's so I've I've, I've written numerous research appli oh, applications, job mm. applications, research proposals, mm. research applications, and so on. And I think that that's paid off. So when you, when you do that a lot, then mm. somewhere some door opens, and, and you can continue doing. What that's very insightful. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so you you mentioned teaching, and mm -hmm. that um, uh, right, uh, leads to my next question. Mm -hmm. um, so you have quite a vast experience and training in teaching various things. Could you talk a little bit about um, the topics that you've taught, the courses that you've taught, and also about your teaching philosophy? How do you see teaching as an activity? Uh, yeah, I, I, I like teaching a lot. I think it's just in principle, it's a way, it's not just, I, I don't see myself as a teacher. I, I see teaching as a, like a collaborative activity where I learn a lot from the students. 
and it's amazing how much you learn, especially now. I think that the, the society is changing so quickly, so rapidly, and I, I sometimes think that I'm just stuck to thinking about what I think about. But then when I interact with the students, I realize, okay, things are happening outside in the world, and other things as well. So I really learn a lot from them. Um, I've, said, I've taught quite a few different topics. So I've, I've, as I mentioned, I've taught general linguistics. So basically introductory ling courses in general linguistics, pragmatics, semantics, uh, morphology, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, history of linguistics, so these kinds of courses, classics in linguistics and so on. And then in, in, in English I taught uh, grammar courses, so it's functional grammar, structures of English, so, so more usage-based courses in English. What else? Then language and the body, so going more into the, sort of the conversation analytic mm -hmm. area, and focusing especially on multimodality and mm -hmm. gestures and so on. Uh, what else? I've recently taught a course on interaction in virtual reality, wow. which is something I'm, I'm really fascinated about. Uh, something perhaps for the future, so I don't know what's happening with new technologies. That was a very nice course, so we collected data with uh, uh, my students mm -hmm. and, and now my, some of my students are using that to do their master's thesis, that, that wow. data, so that's quite nice. Uh, then some sort of also courses that are sort of training students' professional skills mm -hmm. as language experts, mm -hmm. so sort of not really and not at all connected to conversation analysis, but something uh, to do with becoming a language expert. Uh, then I've taught a course on English, the use of English and, and the role of the English language in Finland. So that's more kind of a discourse analytic course. Uh, what else? I can't remember anymore. Wow. Um, but, but many different kinds of courses. And uh, well, my teaching philosophy, I mean, if it's I think one term that, sort of a professional term that can be used to describe my teaching philosophy is so, social constructive mm -hmm. teaching philosophy. And I think that means that when, when a teacher is uh, using social constructive principle in his or her teaching, it, it means that uh, uh, the teacher sort of uh, maybe gives a lot of space to the students and recognizes their backgrounds and histories mm -hmm. that, they, that they are experts mm -hmm. already in, in, in different areas in different ways and the idea is to to let the students use their background and their knowledge and try to connect that to the learning objectives in a particular course mm -hmm. so that they can integrate their what mm -hmm. they know already with what, what is being taught and uh, and I also one sort of theory that really directs my teaching is it's called constructive alignment. Mm -hmm. Now the term doesn't really mean anything. Uh, it's it's not self-explanatory. But what it means is that you have you have different elements of teaching. You have assessment. You have uh, contents. You have the teaching methods. And and then you have that's the fourth thing. But in constructive alignment, when, when you're planning your teaching, all these things have to be mm -hmm. in alignment. So that when you're, it's the student's background, what, yeah, mm -hmm. what, what their background is, who the, who, who the students are. So all the, I mean, you have to consider all these things together when you're planning your teaching. Mm -hmm. So you can't forget, you, you just can't decide what you're going to teach without considering the methods or considering who the students are. So these things have to be in, aligned, in, in alignment. And so that's something that I sort of continuously think about when I'm planning my teaching. Right. Um, and now going back to your research. Um, so your research experience and expertise spans a 
across several quite different domains. So starting with stance and um, intersubjectivity, uh, news interviews, and then more recently multi-activity, interactions in cars, mm. just to name a few. Um, could you talk a little bit about the kind of projects that you did um, around these topics, um, the projects that you're currently working on, mm. and even projects that you're planning to start? Yeah, so we already talked about the stance project, so maybe there's I've said enough about that, maybe. But then after that, I, I got I got an idea, I think it was in 2006 or something like that, that it would be very interesting to study interaction in class. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I started to think about how to do that, uh, what kinds of things could be looked at and studied. And uh, so that started to gradually develop into a project. And then at some point I got funding for a project that was called Talk and Drive. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was very interesting in two respects, I think. So one was that it, it was the focus specifically on what happens inside cars when, when drivers and passengers are journeying together. So mm -hmm. how do they organize their actions? How do they interact? And so that was one thing. But then sort of, it was kind of a spin-off of that was sort of the relationship between interaction and mobility. So sort of any mobile mm -hmm. situation, how do people talk when they are being mobile? Sort of, so do th those two things uh, uh, emerged from that idea and, and started to develop into, into further projects and publications. So that was very interesting and, uh, and I was very lucky to, to work with the right people in that project. So I was working with Paul McIlvenny, mm -hmm. also Matthias Broth, mm -hmm. uh, and Maurice Neville, mm -hmm. uh, who were sort of. It was really exciting to to exchange ideas with them. Uh, also Lorenzo Mandada, of course, and, uh, and and to sort of to understand interaction and the organisation of interaction in, in in sort of a somewhat complex setting. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe a, a different setting compared to a static where a static situation where people are sitting and talking to each other. So, so that was interesting. And maybe that then led to the, the idea of multi-activity, because mm -hmm. then driving is kind of a, a situation where many things can be progressing at the same time. So I started to think about, okay, well, what does this mean when people are doing two things at the same time or when there are two activities that are progressing simultaneously. How do people manage that in the interaction? And uh, so that, that's what, that was the next project, so the multi-activity project. And uh, now I, I applied funding for that and I got funding from the Academy of Finland uh, about two and a half years ago. So I now have uh, one PhD student and uh, and two postdocs working in the project, and uh, quite recently, just a couple of months ago, I, I applied for for more funding for the same project from the University of Oul, and I, I got uh, one more postdoc position and two more PhD student positions. Awesome. So we're going to have a fairly big project on on multi activity. Wonderful. So that's that's developed into something quite interesting. Uh, then there's also the, uh, this was originally Maurice Neville's idea to, to look at objects, in, in the role of objects in interaction, mm -hmm. and then, then we edited a, a book on that together with Trina Heinemann and Milka Raumio. Mm -hmm. And that's been something that I've also been interested in, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to look at how sort of the material environment or objects, what, what kind of role do they have in interaction. Uh, so those are kind of the things that I, I, I've been looking at, the kind of the projects that I've been working in. And, uh, and as I said, I've been very, very lucky to work with the right people in the project. So without the other people, it wouldn't have been possible. So that's been very nice. Uh, about new projects, um, uh, there are, there's one, um, this sort of connects to my linguistics, 
-hmm. background. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the connection between gestures and, and ling or grammar mm -hmm. and grammatical units. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially if, if you look at terms, single term constructional units, so how gestures are connected to particular elements in mm -hmm. term construction mm -hmm. units. Uh, it will be very, very interesting to look at that. So I basically have a project, I have a proposal, and I've applied for funding, but I haven't received any funding for that yet. Excellent. Yes. Uh, but so, but that's at a standstill at the moment. So maybe, I, maybe one day I, I'll have time to focus on that again. <laughs> so that's something. Uh, another thing that I, I, I hope I can do sometime in the future. And then there are two other things. So I just mentioned virtual reality. Mm -hmm. uh, technologies are developing so quickly at mm -hmm. the moment. And I think with virtual reality and augmented reality technologies, they, the possibility to have real-time, co-present interaction mm -hmm. uh, in virtual environment, mm -hmm. virtual reality environments, I think that will be, it'll be reality, an everyday thing in the next, I don't know how many years, but mm -hmm. it's there. Mm -hmm. And of course it's interesting to think about, okay, how embodied can it be? How real time can it be? How co-present is it? How, are, how is it different from sort of real life face-to-face -face interaction? Yeah. So those are the kinds of would be would be interested in looking at that and then there's another uh, another thing I won't say more about this because mm -hmm. it's um, the sort of details that mm -hmm. we are uh, still negotiating with my collaborators but this is it's connected to the to the multi activity project but uh, hopefully soon we'll be able to to focus on international crisis management in a particular setting in sort of very busy environments where people are doing many things at the same time but in a particular kind of setting. Mm -hmm. So that, that's something that we are we're keeping our fingers crossed that that will work on. Wow. And, and that will be an interesting thing in the future as well. That sounds really fascinating. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I have just one final question. Mm -hmm. um, usually researchers have a project uh, that they are really fond of, that they're really proud of uh, because of how it worked out, the findings or the kind of mm. implications. Um, do you have such a project? And if yes, why is that your favorite project? Yeah, you sent me the questions beforehand. <laughs> and I was thinking about that question, this question, and it was so difficult. Oh, I, I, I just... <laughs> no, it, no, it was a fascinating question because it really made me think about, okay, what, what would be my sort of favorite project? And uh, I, I couldn't pick one. And I thought, okay, why is that? Why is it not possible to pick one project? And maybe it's because it's sort of each project has its sort of uh, positive things and, and, and nice, you have nice memories about the project, but they're also the same project has its sort of uh, downhills or sort of negative memories or whatever. And, and I started to think about, okay, maybe, maybe this sort of being an academic and a researcher, it's kind of a, it's a journey all together and all the projects are part of the journey. Mm -hmm. And you sort of, you, you mature, you, you learn new things in each project and you're sort of like a, moving in the journey or something like that. And maybe maybe it's the journey that's the the thing and not the individual project. Mm -hmm. I don't know. This is very philosophical but but it was very difficult to to pick one project because they've all been very nice mm -hmm. and all been challenging in their in their own specific ways. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, this has been a wonderful very insightful interview. Thank you very much for taking the time to do it. Thank you, Bob Dana. It's been a pleasure. I was so happy that yeah, I was invited to, to come here. Thank you for accepting and perhaps next time you can tell us about all the projects that um, are supposed to be funding.
how they worked out. I'd be happy to come again. Thank you. Thanks. Cool.